I had this experience first hour singing that song with all of you. Well, not you, the other group, but the last hour. And just God reminded me of what we're doing when we get together. Sometimes we forget that. Sometimes you come here in a hurry to trying to get the kids out of the house or just scrambling to get to church on time or maybe you're carrying a burden or distracted. But when, what it is it when we gather together as God's people and we sing things like that? Do you pay attention to those words? Who is like the Lord our God, strong to save, faithful in love? My debt is paid, your debt's paid, and the victory's won. The Lord's our salvation. It's overwhelming when you think about it. This is what the church is. We come together and we join our voices with Christians all over the world today and all over throughout history singing these truths. It's a remarkable thing that we get to do. Now let's bow and ask God, the Lord of our salvation, to speak to us through his word. Father, we come here from different places, both physically and emotionally, spiritually, but we're all here. We're all here for one reason. You brought us here, even if we don't always recognize that. You're the Lord of our salvation. You're the reason we gather and lift our voices and our minds and our hearts, and we thank you and praise you for forgiving our sin, redeeming our lives, calling us into your family, part of your church. Now we ask you to speak to us through your word because we really need to hear what you have to say. We pray this in your name, Lord Jesus. Amen. Let's start a little quiz. Who likes quizzes? You like game shows? Play a little quiz? I'd like to get you sort of in the, in the, in the subject matter of what we're going to talk about, uh, influence and wealth, by asking you three questions. First, who has the most Instagram followers in the world? Want, it's not multiple choice. You just have to know this one. We want to guess? It's not Kanye. He's, he's in the top ten. It's not one of the Kardashians. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'll tell you who it is. It's Cristiano Ronaldo, the international soccer phenom and star with 205 million Instagram followers. I am not one of the 205 million. Maybe you are, okay? All right, next question. Who, uh, according to those who calculate these things, is the richest person in the world? Jeff Bezos was, but apparently, I don't know how they calculate this, uh, our good friend Bill Gates just recently overtook him again by a couple of billion. With $104 billion, there's a website called Spend Bill Gates' Money where you can calculate, it's, like, it's got like a calculator, and you could like go online and buy stuff not really, but it tells you how much you have left over. For example, did you know that if you were Bill Gates, you could buy every NFL team, all 32 NFL teams, and still have $21 billion left over? If I were Bill Gates, I would do that, actually. <laughs> Which is probably why I don't have that. Number three, who is the largest private landowner in the world? Catholic Church, somebody said. They're, they're, in, the, they're in the top. Number one, Queen Elizabeth II of England. 6.6, she looks a little creepy in that picture, 6.6 .6 billion acres, billion acres. You know who's number two? Some Saudi prince who only, owes, only owns 500 million acres, only. It's astounding when you think about the amount of wealth and possessions and influence and power amassed in individuals in the world. All of that, and I did have some fun this week on Google looking at all this stuff. That's, all of that is nothing compared to what we're going to look at this morning. Just Nothing compared to the possessions, power, influence, and wealth and riches of our God from Psalm 24. We're in a series called Songs of the Soul, looking at the book of Psalms. 150 Psalms, we're just, we're just choosing 10 for 10 weeks to look into these, how the Psalms, the ancient book of the prayers and poems and songs of God's people, how they help us express our heart to God, how they teach us and give us a vocabulary for our faith. Last couple of weeks, we've looked at two kinds of psalms, versions of the same psalm, psalms of lament. We've explored how Pastor Jason Cusick three weeks ago talked to us about how, how the psalm, psalms can help us express our own anguish, our own suffering, our own despair and depression and fear and anxiety internally. And last week, we looked at Psalm 10, the psalm of lament for justice, injustice in the world, how the psalms help us express what we feel. We look out at the world and see the injustice that exists. Psalm 24, which we'll look at this morning, is different than either of these kinds of psalms in that there's no question made of God. There's no questioning God. There's not even a petition, God, give me this. It's a psalm that's it's a poem declaring the glory of God. It's the psalm of glory. Praise to the glory of God. Let's read together Psalm 24. If you have your Bibles, you can turn there or follow along on the screen as I read Psalm 24. David wrote this psalm. 
He begins, the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, the world and all those who dwell therein. For he has founded it upon the seas and established it upon the rivers. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? He who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully, he will receive blessing from the Lord and righteousness from the God of his salvation. Such is the generation of those who seek him, who seek the face of the God of Jacob. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord strong and mighty, the Lord mighty in battle. Lift up your heads, O gates, and lift them up, O ancient doors, that the King of glory may come in. Who is this King of glory? The Lord of hosts. He is the King of glory. Now, David wrote this psalm in the very first two verses. In the last portion, it begins and ends with these declarations about God's power and his sovereign control over all things. These are declarative statements that are answering one central question around which the whole psalm turns. It comes later in the psalm, but it's the central question of the psalm. Who is the king of glory? Who is this we're talking about? Who is this we're singing about when we come together on a Sunday morning? Who is it you're praying to? Whose word is this? Who are we worshiping? Who is this king of glory? The first answer that David gives us is that, among many things, he's the creator and owner of all that exists. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. The world is the Lord's and all who dwell in it. He owns it all. Psalm 89, 11, the heavens are yours, the earth is yours, the world and all it contains, you have founded them. It is all yours, O Lord. Deuteronomy 10, 14, behold, to the Lord your God belong heaven and the highest heavens, the earth and all that is in it. Psalm 50, verse 10, for every beast of the forest is mine, the cattle on a thousand hills, I know every bird of the air. Job 41, 11, who has given to me that I should repay him? Whatever is under heaven is mine. Moms and dads, did you have to teach your kids the word mine? They sort of figured that one out on their own, didn't they? Mine! Mine! We learn how to say mine and think of things as ours very early. It's just in us. God is, David is saying, there's only one in the universe who can rightfully say of everything that exists, mine. And it's not you. It's him. Who is the king of glory? He's the one who owns it all. Abraham Kuyper says, There is not a square inch of the whole domain of our human existence over which God, who is sovereign over all, does not rightfully cry, Mine. In case you're missing the point, that includes you. You are His. He can rightfully claim over your life, Mine. That does not really sit well with our American suburban independent sensibilities. Nobody owns me. I'm the captain of my faith, the master of my own soul. Actually, according to Psalm 24, no, you're not. The earth is the Lord's and all who dwell in it. You belong to him, whether you want to admit that, acknowledge that or not. The Apostle Paul makes this clear in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 19 and 20. He's speaking about what we do with our bodies, sexually specifically, but about what we do with our bodies. And he says, don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit within you? Whom you have from God, you are not your own. You were bought with a price, so therefore glorify God in your body. You're not your own. You don't belong to you. Remember years ago, talking with a friend of mine who was a, a Christian brother, but he um, he was struggling with anger. He was, I think, it was one of his besetting sins most of his life. But he was God was working on him, and he was making some progress. But something happened to one of his family members that was terribly unjust. And I understood his anger. We met for coffee, and he was just venting. And you gotta, let, you got to vent sometimes. We met, and he was just railing about what had happened and how wrong it was. And I was just letting him do it. And then he started talking crazy. He started saying things that, like, you shouldn't be saying. Like, threatening. I'm going to do this, and I'm going to do And somebody's got to do something. And like, I'm like, whoa, whoa, time out. You, you, you can't do that. Why not? In anger, he said. And I didn't plan to, but I, just, I quoted this psalm, this verse, 1 Corinthians 6. Because... You're not your own. You don't belong to you. You don't get to act that way. It's okay to vent, but you don't get to do that. Why? Because you were bought with a price. You belong to another. He said that verse, of the word of God, is what kind of woke him up, snapped him out of it. You wake up every morning. I don't. 
but maybe you do, and we should. Wake up every morning, tomorrow morning, get up and remind yourself, I don't belong to me. My life is not my own. I'm owned by another, the one who made me. The earth is the Lord's and everyone in it, including you. So who's the king of glory? He's the sovereign creator of all that exists. And therefore he owns it all, including your life. Now it's one thing to answer this question like a true or false question, right? Class, true or false? God owns everything. True or false? True. That's easy to say. You're in church, you say it. It's a whole other thing to live that way, isn't it? To live my life as if I, I, it's not mine. I belong to another. He has claim over me. Now, in the next part of the psalm, David asks another related question. In verse 3, he says, Who can ascend the hill of the Lord and who can stand in his presence, in his holy place? He's talking about if God is a sovereign Lord of all creation who created everything that exists, who can come into his presence? Who can approach the king of glory? Who can do this? Now, I've got to give you a little background to this psalm for it to make sense why David is asking this question this way. Why he says, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Some of you might know this from your Bible study. Maybe you don't, but I won't take you there. We don't have time, but I'll just, you can read it later. In 2 Samuel chapter 6, we get this Old Testament story out of which this psalm was most likely either written in response to or during. So David is king of Israel. He's early on in his reign as king. To consolidate power uh, politically and nationally, he decides to make Jerusalem the capital city of Israel. It will later become known as the holy city, but it wasn't yet. David builds his great palace there. The temple has not been built yet. That comes later under Solomon, one of David's descendants. So David makes Jerusalem the capital city, uh, and he decides to, as a symbol of God's favor and presence, he's going to bring the Ark of the Covenant into the city, into Jerusalem. Now, some of you will know about the Ark of the Covenant because you learned from the great Bible teacher, the Raiders of the Lost Ark movie, what the Ark of the Covenant is. If you're in my generation, that's how I learned what the Ark of the Covenant was. I still have bad dreams about that guy's face melting off, right? And I didn't know that you could just close your eyes and therefore nothing bad touches you. I didn't know that was possible. You don't know what I'm talking about. Take your young ones. No, just kidding. Watch this. The Ark of the Covenant was a wood box all covered in gold. And on top of the box, it was ornately uh, designed. God gave specific instructions for it, for its dimensions, for its size. Inside were the stone tablets on which God wrote his, the covenant law, the Ten Commandments to Moses at, at Sinai. Also Aaron's staff, the, the showbread, bread of presence was in there. But on top were these winged creatures called cherubim that were facing inward, their wings over their heads, touching their wingtips in the center of the ark, all covered in gold. And at that point where the wings touched was called the mercy seat or the throne, the symbolic place where God dwelt by his presence. The ark would later be placed in the Holy of Holies inside the temple. It was to stand in the presence of the ark was to stand in the presence and power of God himself. David is doing something very symbolic and powerful. I'm going to bring the presence of God symbolically, back into the city. God back with his people, dwelling among us. He has it all planned out. He's going to have all the citizens of Jerusalem line the streets in, coming into the city. He's going to parade the, the ark in with some of his men, and they're going to celebrate and cheer, and he's going to put it in the city. It'll be a, a great big event. Only he doesn't exactly follow the instructions God gave for how to move the ark. In fact, he has a couple of his guys throw it in the back of an ox cart. And they're making their way into the city. And one of the oxen strikes his uh, hoof on a stone and stumbles. And the, ark, and the cart tips. And the ark wobbles. And a guy walking alongside one of David's men named Uzzah reaches out to keep it from falling and touches it. And he drops dead. Poor guy. Just doing what the king said. This freaks David out. <laughs> you think? He's terrified. He, he scraps the whole project. Stop, time out. He even says... How can the ark come to me? He realizes in that moment, we can't do this this way. So he stops the whole, sh whole show, and he sticks the ark in the house of a guy named Obed-Edom. How'd you like to be that guy? <laughs> I don't want it. Too bad we're putting it here. Put it in the garage. <laughs> David realizes in that moment, you don't come to God on your own terms. You don't come into the presence of the king of glory casually. Make it up the rules as you go along. You don't get to decide. Let's, you make up these. You come on his terms. You don't come at all. You're coming into his presence, his holiness, his glory. 
This terrifies David. Now, this is the context in which David asked the question, who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who can stand in his holy place? What kind of a God is this that if you approach in the wrong way, you drop dead? What kind of people do we have to be to be in his presence? That's the question. Now, you might be hearing this story and going, I I just, I don't like the idea of a God who would strike somebody down just for touching the ark the wrong way. We're talking about the holiness of God. It's hard for us to get our minds around that. Holiness is not just his moral perfection or character. It's the essence of who God is, that he's holy other than us, dwells in unapproachable light. This is an imperfect analogy, but years ago, I was on a missions trip when I was in college, Pastor John and I, in fact, on the same trip, uh, to Canton, Mississippi. We were working, this is in the same county in which the Mississippi burning actually happened. We were working on housing projects for these, these home, uh, people in this, in, in this, members of this church in the community. And I was on a, a job to tear off a porch and build a new porch. And I, my, on this day, I'm standing on a step stool and I've got Lyman's pliers and I'm supposed to cut the power line, the main line to the porch. And I asked them, the power's off, the power's off. Yeah, the power's off, go ahead, cut the line. Got up on the step, pulled those pliers together, the power wasn't off. Boom! Sparks knocked me flat off the, I went sailing off the step ladder onto my back, had a, a mark down my arm, uh, and, and, I mean, I could feel like my, my whole arm and chest were, were tingling. If it wasn't rubber-coated pliers, I'd be dead. Wouldn't be here preaching to you right now. I'd be with Jesus, but I'd be not here. The pliers were fused together from the electricity. They were like welded, melted together. And I'm laying on my back. I was a little mad at the guy who told me the power was off. I'll tell you who I wasn't mad at. I wasn't mad at the electricity. I didn't get up and say, curse you, electricity. How dare you do this to me? It just is. You don't mess around with it. You don't come to it on your own terms or it will kill you. This is kind of what the holiness of God is. It just is. Holy other than you. We are not holy. He's perfect. You don't come into his presence on your terms. But he's also merciful and good. We'll come back to that. David answers the question, who can come into his presence? Who can stand in his, in his holy place? In verse 4, he who has clean hands and a pure heart, who does not lift up his soul to what is false and does not swear deceitfully. Psalm 24 begins and ends with declarations about the glory and holiness of God. And we are in the middle, which is kind of, it's, it's true about our lives. We are sandwiched between the glory of God. We find ourselves bookended by God. Same thing in the psalm. In the middle then, David says, the only one who can come in his presence is one who has clean hands and a pure heart. He gives two qualities that are kind of a pair here. Clean hands means your external life. Pure heart means your internal life. Clean hands. Living outwardly in a way that reflects the character and nature of the God whom you belong to, who made you in his image and his claim over your life. The way you treat and love your neighbor, the way you seek justice in the world, the way you speak truth, your external behaviors, that's what clean hands is symbolizing. Pure heart means your internal life, loving God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, making him your first allegiance to seek him above all others and growing in devotion to God. In other words, it's not just your actions that matter, it's the motivation behind your actions that also matter. On the other hand, good intentions aren't enough. You have to have right actions. You know in the Bible, in Romans 3, which is quoting in uh, Psalm chapter 14, which says there's no one who does good, not even one. You ever hear that? No one does good. Does that sound like, it, like God, like maybe that's overstating it a bit? Really? Nobody does, ever does anything good? I, I know some of you. You've done very good things. Some of you. Not all. Right? No, just kidding. <laughs> On a relative scale, we've all done a good deed. People do good things. That's not what the Bible's saying. It's saying no one ever perfectly has clean hands and a pure heart. No one does good purely for good's sake with the right motivation. All of the time. Jonathan Edwards in his book, uh, Nature of True Virtue, writes about this, saying, For an action to be good in God's sight, truly good, it must be perfectly executed, done rightly, and purely motivated. All the time. Well, who's, who qualifies? That at our best... I do things imperfectly with mixed motives on my best day. On my worst day, I just don't even do them at all. 
for I do them with an evil heart. David says, only those who have clean hands and a pure heart can come into the presence of God. In case that wasn't enough, he goes on and he says, who does not lift up his soul to what is false. This in the Hebrew, by the way, is, this, is very similar to the command uh, that thou shalt not take the name of the Lord in vain. Some of you grew up here and that meant you shouldn't use God's name as a swear word, and that's certainly true. But it means more than that. Do not lift up my soul to what is false. Do not live my life for what is empty and vain. That's what lifting up your soul means. The point is you can't structure your life around your own desires and then slap God's name on it. It doesn't work that way. You don't get to live for yourself and then claim the name over God over that and say this is what God wants. That's lifting up your soul to what is false. That's ordering your life around yourself and then trying to say that God's pleased. And then he says, do not swear deceitfully. This echoes the ninth commandment. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. doesn't just mean telling lies. It means how you handle the truth. Specifically, if you're, if you're saying, I belong to God, then my commitment to him is a commitment to truth. I don't get to shade the truth, spin the truth, color the truth, manipulate the truth, or twist it or bend it to suit my needs. Some of us will say, well, I'm not telling lies. I'm just, you know... Rearranging the facts to benefit myself. I, get the, I speak the truth about me, about you, and about God. Even if it costs me something. Even if it isn't convenient. Even if others don't understand it. Okay, so think about this. David says, these are the ones who receive blessing from the Lord, righteousness and salvation from their God. These are the ones who can stand in his presence. Who? Perfect action, perfect motivation, heart always in line with God first, and who never ever speaks a falsehood. Okay? Let's divide the room now. Who measures up? It's a problem. It's a problem. And if you're thinking, not for me, that's a problem. Right? It's a big problem. David knows this. David knows that as king, neither he nor his people have ever consistently lived up to this standard. They cannot, they do not deserve to stand in the presence of God. And neither do we. And neither do we. But David also knows that God is a God of steadfast love and kindness. He writes in Psalm 145, verse 8, The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. So David tries the whole ark thing again. This time following carefully the instructions of the Lord. And as they, the priests carried on the poles as they were instructed, uh, about every 10 steps, they make sacrifices to God for their sin. And the people are worshiping and bowing down in reverence. And the whole procession is a picture of the holiness of God and the worship of his people. This is the context for the next section of the psalm. Verses 7 through 10. Let me read verse 7. Lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors, that the king of glory may come in. In verse 3, David says, who can come into the presence of God? In verse 7 and verse 9, David says, the presence of God is coming in. So one is, how can we come to him? The other is, apparently he's coming to us. He's coming in. How does this work? How does the king of glory come in? This is the final question I want to ask. How does the king of glory come in? David says, Who may ascend the hill of the Lord and who shall stand in his holy place? Who is this king of glory? Well, we are reading this psalm as Christians. We are reading this psalm looking back to the king of glory who did come in. Because there was a Sunday long ago when the king of glory rode in on a donkey. We call it Palm Sunday. He wrote into crowds shouting. Oh, they're shouting? Hosanna. Blessed is the king who comes in the name of the Lord. Who can ascend the hill of the Lord? Who is this king of glory? Well, we worship the king of glory who was taken up a hill called Golgotha, was raised up on a cross, roused from the grave, and ascended into heaven, and is right now in the presence of the Father. Who is this king of glory? He's the one we're told will come back in all his glory 
to judge all that is his. He's the rightful judge because he's the owner and creator of it all. And his name is Jesus. He's the king of glory. Almost all Old Testament scholars will tell you that this psalm turns in verse 7. David's talking about what happened with the ark, the presence of God symbolically coming to his people. And then he's prophetically looking forward to what will happen, saying, lift up your heads, O gates, be lifted up, that the king of glory may come in. Looking forward to what would one day happen and will happen. And it's happening still today. Who has clean hands and a pure heart? Who does not lift up his soul to what is false? Who always speaks perfect truth? Only one. Only one. Jesus. The true and only king of glory. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 12 tells us that he entered once for all into the holy place. David asked the question. uh, Not quite yet. Hebrews 9. He says that he enters into the holy place once for all. Remember David says who can stand in his holy place? Hebrews tells us. Jesus comes and stands there, enters in there, not by means of blood and, of bulls and goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing for us an eternal redemption. He did this so that you and I could come into his presence. Now let's look at Hebrews 10. Hebrews 10, verses 19 through 23. This is a remarkable passage answering the question David asks about who can come into the presence of God. Therefore, brothers and sisters, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest of the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Remember the question, clean hands and a pure heart? There it is. Our bodies washed and our consciences sprinkled. And let us consider, hold fast to the uh, the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. Who is this king of glory? He's Jesus. Who shall ascend the hill of the Lord? Jesus did. Who can stand this holy place? Jesus is right now. Who has clean hands and a pure heart and always speaks truth? Jesus. He's the king of glory. In Psalm 24, verse 3, David says, who can do this? In Psalm 24, verse 9, he says, the king of glory is coming in. He has come in to the temple. He will someday come back and the whole earth will be his temple. Between that day and the day to come, today, the king of glory still comes into human hearts. This king of glory still enters in to human hearts. Do you hear what Paul said? Don't you know that your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit in which God dwells? The king of glory is still coming in to to take residence in you and in me and in us as church. When David says in Psalm 24, lift up your heads, O gates, and be lifted up, O ancient doors. It echoes what Jesus says in Revelation chapter 3, verse 20. Behold, he says, I stand at the door and knock. What does he say? If anyone hears my voice... And opens the door. What door are you opening? What's the door? It's not rhetorical. You have to say it. Yes, exactly right. Behold, I stand at the door of your heart and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens up the door of their heart, I will come in. The king of glory will come in and eat with you and you with me. This is, if I ask somebody if you're a Christian, and they say I'm working at it, I'm trying to be, I'm getting there, there's a fundamental misunderstanding. It's a yes or no question, friends. Now, you may have a lot of growing to do and a lot of work that God wants to do in your life. You have either heard his voice and opened the door of your heart, or you haven't. That doesn't mean you're perfect. It doesn't mean all your problems go away. But you've either lifted up your head and lifted up the gates of your heart and said, come in, Lord. Forgive my sin. You're the king of glory. You have rightful claim. I don't want to resist you anymore. I give my life to you. Or you haven't done that. That's what it means to be a Christian. Now, once you have done that, and he will come in, he says, and he does come in, then begins a whole life of learning to follow him, becoming different by his grace, Two steps forward, one step back. We're all in process. Nobody's got it all together. But the starting point is what we're talking about right here. Lift up your heads. Open up the gates of your heart. 
so the king of glory could come in. You know, it's possible to come to church for years, decades, and never do that. Talked to a man just two weeks ago who that was his story. Coming here for decades, two decades, had never done that. Had never said, come in. Come in, Lord. I'm tired of resisting. I'm tired of trying to run, it my, run the show my way. I know you have rightful claim. I know I'm broken. I know I'm a mess. You come in. And the great thing is, he will. He does. You can't come to him on your terms. You can't come to him casually, flippantly, making up the rules as you go. But you can come to him because of Jesus. That's the door. That's the gate. And Psalm 24 is for you this morning. Lift up your heads. Open up the gates of your heart that the King of glory would come in. Now, some of you have done that like I have. Maybe it's been years ago. Maybe it's been more recent. Maybe you've forgotten, but you need to be reminded. But I know, I know that there's some of you here who know about God, but you're playing a religious game. You've never opened up the gates of your heart and said, Jesus, come in. Forgive my sin. Clean my hands and make my heart pure. Take over. You are the King of glory. And he will. So I'm going to give you an opportunity to do that right now. We're going to bow. And if this is already true of you, you just pray and thank God that the King of Glory has come in and does love you. And pray for those who are sitting next to you. But if you haven't, I invite you to pray this with me. Let's bow. Lord Jesus, you are the King of Glory. You created all that exists. And you have rightful claim over every square inch of the universe and every square inch of my heart. Forgive me for resisting you, for trying to live my own way. I recognize that I do not have clean hands. I do not have a pure heart. And I receive what you offer at the cross, forgiveness and freedom. And I ask you, Lord Jesus, the King of glory, to come in and give you my life now and forever. Amen.